Hey everybody. So today I thought I'd go over um, how I LS swapped my truck. When I was kind of figuring out if I was going to try to do this, I kind of wished there was a, a video that went over as much as, as you really can on an individual project that isn't yours about how people were doing stuff, uh, where things were getting wired in, uh, what parts to buy, um, different options as to what you can do with a fuel system or, or uh, uh, PCM or anything like that. So I figured I'd go over the way I did it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I would do differently. This is my first one and uh, I made some mistakes, but um, I think that uh, it went well overall. I mean, I drove it all last summer, so it's not uh, not a bad not a bad outcome. So this is an L fifty nine out of a uh, two thousand six GMC Yukon. It uh, it is the flex fuel version, and it because it's a two thousand six, it, it, it's supposed to have the upgraded rods that a Gen four would get, but it's all Gen three electronics, which is just simpler. Um, the transmission and engine control is all within one box instead of having to have a separate TCM. Um, you can see that I didn't even really clean it before I put it in. This is the factory intake, and it's just dusty. Um, the vehicle was used as a camp vehicle primarily before this. So uh, The engine only has about 80,000 miles on it. The Yukon I took it out of had 225,000 miles. Uh, the first engine developed an injector seal leak, leaked down into the oil, diluted the oil, and uh, spun the rod bearings and seized it up. This one is drive-by wire. Um, so you see that I've got a harness. It's not a cable that comes to my throttle body, which is right here. Um, and this is a little motor that when I push the, push the throttle down in the truck, it opens the throttle blades and uh, uh, increases the RPM, just like a cable would, it just does it electronically. I did replace the plugs and wires. So you can see those are aftermarket wires on there. Um, they're okay, they're not great, uh, but they work. The intake tract I took out of the Yukon. Um, it's a little ugly, but it gets the job done. The air filter sits in here. Right now, it's fully unsupported, so it just bounces around. But I'm going to replace this, I think, with uh, what people call a cold air intake. It's, I, it just looks a little nicer and cleans this up, makes everything in here a little bit more serviceable. I did have to extend the MAF wiring, the uh, mass airflow sensor wiring. PSI assumes you're going to key use an aftermarket intake and... Uh, keep the math over here more like a where the where the factory factory intake would be the battery wouldn't be here in, in the factory c10 this is i moved this over so i could use this intake track so i just had to extend it i didn't want to cut the wires it'd be easy enough it's only a few wires but i didn't want to cut it i just bought this on amazon and it, it works fine the battery is relocated to the driver's side as i mentioned um, this is using the support bracket from a C20 or C30 that had auxiliary batteries. So this is the auxiliary battery support. It did not come with a battery tray. I thought it did, but it didn't. So I have to cut the tray off my factory one and spot weld it onto this. And then I won't have to ratchet strap my battery to the top of just the support. But this holds it well for now. It's not going anywhere. So uh, you can see the wiring's a bit of a mess. The whole truck needs to be rewired. But I kind of just threw this together to make it running and safe. Um, I'm using the battery cables from the Yukon. That was the reason I wanted to relocate the battery over here primarily. Uh, I didn't want to have to make new battery cables and they're designed to run kind of across and around that way. So uh, this was just easier. Um, this is for the electronic fans. So this is PSI's fan wiring harness. It only supports one fan. I have a dual fan set up, but I've only got one plugged in and it's been more than adequate for me. I'll add the second fan later, but it's not, not critical and not a huge rush. Um, this is the ground signal that turns the fans on. That goes straight to the PCM. The PCM tells the fans when to turn on. This is a uh, ignition on power to activate the relay. The ground is the signal. And when that ground gets activated, it sends power directly from the battery to the fans through this heavier gauge wire. You can see that goes right to my junction block right here. You can see here I used hot rod fuel hose um, and lines. I'd never done this before and I did not have the AN wrenches. So you can see that I marred up the finish on them, which is unfortunate, but I'm gonna be replacing a lot of this anyway. I don't wanna do the saddle tank anymore. Um, I'd like to move the tank behind the rear wheels 
and uh, so I'll have to rerun all this anyway. But this got me running, and the, and the quality of the kit's really good. I'll buy another kit from Hot Rod Fuel Hose without any, any questions. Their support's been really good too. Um, but I'll talk about this in a little bit. The radiator that I'm using is the same radiator that, that would have been in the Yukon. It's, a, it's the wide core uh, radiator. This is a replacement because the radiator that was in the Yukon was a little bit beat up, but these are the fans out of the Yukon. Um, saved me quite a bit of money to have the full full parts car here and be able to pull little things like this add up. The radiator wasn't too expensive, thankfully, um, but I did have to do that. It has transmission cooler in it. For me, at my current power level, it's more than enough to cool the transmission, but uh, uh, I may end up having an aux auxiliary transmission cooler later, but for now it works. And uh, you can see that's what, this, that's what these braided lines here are. They wrap around and go down to the transmission. They connect right here. Uh, I would recommend getting your, for, for this kind of stuff, I'd recommend getting your braided lines from Summit Racing. That's where I got mine. This is their their braided braided hose. It works great. It's much nicer than this, which was an eBay kit, uh, and the fittings were bad, and the hose is low quality. This is much higher quality, uh, and I did have to spend a little bit more on Russell fittings, but it was worth it. Uh, you can see they're right there. It was worth the money because the fitting quality really made the assembly and maintenance on this much easier than than cheap fittings that, that don't want to screw together or don't rotate or just aren't aren't very high quality the exhaust is kind of cobbled together um it's what people call tbss exhaust manifolds it stands for trailblazer ss mine came off a of buick rainier which is the same vehicle just different badging that had a 5.3 in it um, you can see that i sprayed high temp paint on it really quickly before i installed them but they've rusted through. They're just cast, so this isn't really detrimental. It just is ugly. They go down to um, right here. That's an O2 sensor. There's one on both sides. That's a stub off of the Y pipe off a truck that I just cut apart and then welded some um, some hardware store tubing on, part store tubing on, to meet up with the rest of the exhaust. It's not pretty, and I had never welded before I welded those, so I've had to go back through and re-weld them a couple times, and I'm sure there's still some leaks, but uh, it works for now. It gets the exhaust out the back of the truck, or most of it. So uh, that's a Cherry Bomb glass pack. It's up really far. A piece of advice is to move it back, keep it as far back towards the back of the vehicle as you can, you can fit. It'll keep drone out of the cab. Um, so the whole thing is supposed to be two and a half inch exhaust, but I didn't have enough on this side, which is the passenger side. So I didn't want to run back to the parts store. I had some two and a half inch tubing laying here. I just kind of cobbled together. It's half two and a half, half two and a quarter. It runs fine. It does cause some fun things in the tune. Um, but I'll, I need to, I'm going to weld up a whole new 90 degree bend and maybe even out the back. I'm not sure. I haven't decided yet, um, but we'll see. But I'd never welded before and I'd never done really built custom or any kind of exhaust before. And I still managed to throw it together. Uh, it's kind of what I want to show everybody with the channel is, it doesn't matter if you've never done it before. If you just start doing it, you'll eventually figure out a way to get it done and make it work. It doesn't have to be pretty. This is None of this is pretty. The wiring is ugly. Didn't clean anything. Um, using part store parts. Like this is, a, um, this is the transmission dipstick and it came from a 2005 um, Chevy 2500 and it fit perfect. It has no issue at all. The transmission is out of a 2005 Chevy van. Uh, 4L80E, it's heavy duty transmission. The The transmission actually is a GM remanufactured unit. It's got low miles, uh, probably close to 10,000 miles on it now, but it works fine. It was pretty cheap. I think I paid $500 for it. So I uh, filled it with fluid and off we go. This is actually the uh, the oil dipstick, engine oil dipstick out of the, out of the Yukon. Um, I did have to bend a little bit because I had bent it trying to get it out. They tend to stick in the uh, oil pan. This one, luckily, I, it stuck, but I got everything out and uh, no leaks or anything. So it works. One thing I do want to mention is this is your water pump right here. Um, so that's where your coolant, that's what pushes your coolant through the engine. If you just block these off because you're not going to use heat, you won't be fully cooling your engine. You need to at least loop these. You can see mine's looped quite long it doesn't need to be this long there's a couple couple companies make short loops that go here um my heater core is broken so i didn't want to feed coolant into the heater core and have it leak in the cab and smell so i'll fix that next year when it's not cold out um but so for now it's, it's looped just to just to make sure we get good coolant flow through the engine and we do it stays below 200 degrees uh, even on a hot day 
So I'm happy with that. It's the coolant overflow tank out of the Yukon. Um, you can see I just have it one bolt nut through an existing hole in the in the fender well. I need to do something better about this. You can see it's pretty loose, but it works for the time being. Uh, it doesn't really rattle too bad. This rattles a lot more, but as I mentioned already, that'll get fixed. So inside the truck, uh, I had originally kind of planned on making this somewhat of a race truck. So I really didn't care about integrating my dashboard or anything like that, uh, the factory stuff anyway. So I'm just using a, a tablet with an OBT2 Bluetooth uh, sender. Um, it works well. It's a little bit slow to boot up and a little bit slow to get going, but overall it, it functions perfectly fine. and has most of the important stuff on it. Uh, it is missing oil pressure. That's because the Gen 3 PCMs didn't take oil pressure directly. It came through the body control module rather than the, the, um, the engine engine harness. So it does not have oil pressure wired in. I'm going to wire in a, uh, a standalone gauge for that. But other than that, it's got everything important. Now you can see kind of that the wiring comes up from behind the dash. Uh, that was that hole I drilled in the firewall. And I've got it laid on the floor still. Um, I'm going to probably tuck it behind my glove box or in the glove box uh, until I decide to tear the whole truck apart and paint it. And then I'll mount it permanently on the firewall or somewhere I can still access it. So um, you can see that PSI, I got my, my uh, PCM from PSI. That PCM that they sent me is actually out of a 2005 um, Chevy 2500 truck. They modified it to, to match the specs of the 5.3 engine with the 4.0 E transmission. They prefer to do it that way rather than, than segment swap and change the 4.0 E trans to a 4.0 E trans in the tune. Uh, and it runs good. Um, I, I could probably use to tune it, and I will eventually, but for now it starts and runs, and I get decent gas mileage, and it's got good performance, so I'm okay with it. Um, they send this fuse block, which isn't small. It's really just to run your engine and fans. Um, but it works works really well. Uh, I won't go over what each one of these are. When you order your PSI harness, they have a nice diagram that explains all this. And back here, this black box, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm drive by wire. That's the um, the pedal control module. It's called the tack module. I'm also using PSI's bolt in in throttle pedal. I had tried to adapt the one out of the Yukon and I used it for a little while, but uh, it was at a really weird angle and it's just a big plastic hunk. So I picked this up a little bit of a splurge. You can see the part number right there on it. I haven't taken the sticker off. I also bought their harness. Uh, it does require their harness to go from the pedal to your tack module and it is directional. So make sure you plug your harness in the right direction. So when I was planning to do this, this swap and I kind of planned on, even though I knew I wasn't going to use my speedometer or any of the idiot lights, uh, I did plan on using my fuel gauge. And when I got the new fuel tank in and, and got everything hooked up, even though it should have worked, it didn't. And I couldn't figure out why. So I wanted to drive it and not worry about it being empty. And I was tired of troubleshooting the factory wiring, which is really, really terrible. So I installed an aftermarket fuel gauge. And it works fine. It's, it's accurate enough. I don't worry about running out of fuel. I can basically let it run to, to the E. And I still have a few gallons left in the tank, so that that's perfect. Uh, it means I'll keep it semi-full. Um, the tank I'm using is out of a 1987 Chevy pickup truck, and the reason I'm using that tank is because they were fuel injected, so they've got a little box where the fuel pickup sits that kind of keeps or helps keep some fuel around that pickup when you're low on fuel. Uh, the pickup is also out of a 1987 Chevy pickup truck. Uh, they all connected just fine. I did have to do a little bit of modification to the to the pickups. Uh, at where the fuel line connects just because I'm using the AM line. But otherwise they connect just fine uh, and it works and the level sender is the same voltage as the factory here. The fuel pump I'm using is an EP381 which is a pretty popular and common pump. Uh, it came, it, I, I used 1997 Chevy Silverado with a V8 as my, you know, when I was searching for, for that part. But uh, it came in a bunch of bunch of fuel injected trucks. I think starting in the early '90s, right up through um, '98, I think. So uh, it works fine. It, it supposedly will support up to around 400 horsepower. Uh, so I'll have to upgrade it eventually. But for now, for the totally stock engine I've got in there, it's more than enough. 
couple of things I can't really show you very easily because the truck is low and there's some snow on the ground, water and ice, and I don't want to lay in it. Um, I did have to get a custom drive shaft made uh, because I'm using the 480E, which has a different flange type, uh, and my rear diff. Plus, the 480E is longer than the transmission I had in here, and unfortunately, the drive shaft I had had a dent in it, which means it never would have balanced correctly and really wasn't as strong as, as it could have been. So I had a local shop make me a, a drive shaft. I think it cost me around $300, $300, $320 or something, but it was worth it. Super heavy duty. Um, not going to worry about it even at big power levels if I decide to go turbo or throw slicks on it to get to the track or something like that. So I don't have to worry about that. Um, the fuel system, as I mentioned already, I got from hotrodfuelhose.com. Uh, it basically is AN6 lines or dash six lines, um, some fittings to make it fit over the steel lines and connect to the, um, connect to the fuel rails. And because I have what's called a returnless or deadhead fuel system um, stock on this, I didn't have a return in the fuel hat, I guess is what you'd call it, um, from the pickup and the sender that, that is from the 87 pickup. Uh, has two ports so it wants a, a feed and it wants to get fuel back excess fuel back uh, so to provide that um, I used an, uh, a Corvette a C5 Corvette fuel filter regulator which has um, it recirculates fuel back and just kind of circulates through but automatically regulates to the 58 psi that LS engines and en engines take um, so it has one output an input and then the secondary output goes back to the fuel tank as, as a return to the fuel tank to keep the fuel cycling it works well it keeps the fuel pretty cool which is nice um, not that it gets super hot here in maine and then we have to worry about fuel boiling but that is a problem in warmer climates uh, so if you're going to stay close to stock power level i don't really have an issue i think this is this works fine i mounted it along my frame rail um, I probably want to move it and tuck it up and hide it and protect it a little bit better. But for now, again, it's up out of the way. It's not in danger of getting hit by anything. It's not anywhere near anything hot. So, uh, um, so it's, it's fine where it is for now. Now, I know it seems like there should be more to this, but there really isn't. Um, physically mounting the engine and transmission in was easy. You buy uh, engine mounts from a bunch of different places. I use Dirty Dingo. Uh, Summit has their own. Jegs has their own. Um, countless places make uh, engine mounts. My truck already had a small block Chevy, and it uses the same uprights. Uh, it just you bolt the take your engine mounts off your LS if they're still there when you get it from the junkyard or your or your donor vehicle. Bolt these plates on. Figure out roughly where you want the, you need the engine and transmission to be, and uh, uh, bolt it in. The transmission cross member, uh, if you're going to use your stock transmission, a TH350 or a TH400, depending on what you have, um, you'll need a different a different flex plate to connect the engine to the transmission, but you can probably leave your transmission right where it is. You probably don't even need to move your, your cross member. Um, because I went to 480E, um, I did have to move the cross member, and as a matter of fact, the cross member I had was actually for a three-speed manual because that's what this truck originally was. And there just wasn't a way I could find to make it work without pulling the cab off the off the chassis and drilling more holes and everything. So I actually bought a Dirty Dingo cross member too. Uh, it was a expense that was I didn't I didn't plan for, but it wasn't that bad. I think it was a little over a hundred dollars, and it was worth it. It just bolted in, and um, I can actually adjust the height to adjust the drive shaft angle, drive line angle um, of the transmission. So uh, instead of having to rotate my rear diff, I can probably get my driveline angle right. Uh, it's just a little bit off right now. I just have a minor vibration on the interstate, but uh, I can probably just raise my transmission to get the driveline angle right. Um, driveline angle is something I'm still learning about, but basically you wanna have equal and opposite angles at the rear end and at the transmission to avoid, um, to avoid vibration. And you don't want it to be dead straight um, the U joints, um, so the flexible joints that go in your drive shaft, they want to kind of, they want to be at a little bit of an angle at least. Um, you can probably find more about it than I can explain. As I've said multiple times, this channel is me learning along with you, so um, I don't know for sure off the top of my head what what angles they need to be. But there are optimal angles. Most importantly, they just should be equal and opposite. Um, so if you're four degrees up at the at the uh, at the rear end, you want to be four degrees down at the transmission. I can't really think of anything else I had to do. Uh, as I mentioned already, I'll try to throw in the, the part numbers in the description and maybe even along in the video uh, if I can. 
if it makes sense. Uh, I want to make this as easy and comprehensive as I can for you guys. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop some comments down. Um, I'd be happy to answer everything I can. Um, this is just the way I did it. I think there's a hundred different ways to do this. You could strip out your own harness, um, tune your own PCM. I don't think it's that hard. I just didn't have time, um, so I bought my stuff. Uh, you could go with a Holly engine management system, which if I was going turbo off the bat, I probably would have done. I think it would have been quicker and I'd have been tuning the car already. So, um, and the Holly engine management systems offer a bunch more like um, boost control and nitrous control. And I think you can build your trans brake right into the, into the tune, which is nice. There's a bunch of more racy stuff you can do. This is a driver for me. Uh, it's probably going to stay a driver. Um, it might get a turbo or something down the road, but it's going to be a driver for a while. So the factory stuff um, works perfectly, and I will tune it um, probably with HP tuners. I just need to buy the stuff to do that. Um, I always tell people when they say they're impressed that I got this done or I was able to do this, it's not really, it doesn't seem that impressive. I mean, I can do it, and if you ask any of my friends, I'm not the best mechanic in the world. Uh, I just really love cars. I always have, and I'm willing to kind of dive in and figure stuff out. Uh, there's a lot of resources on the internet. Uh, I'm happy to help anybody reach out to me in any way you can, uh, um, either on my Instagram or here. And I'd be happy to help if I can, answer questions if I can. And and uh, I just want you, you guys to start digging into this stuff, whether it's LS swapping a C10 or, you know, putting an SR20 and a 240SX or uh, whatever is, you know, K-series in your Civic. I don't care. Um, as long as you're playing with cars and, and dive it in even if you don't know what you're doing. Um, not everybody does, it's okay. Now, it seems like most people prefer to hear the truck running than to hear me talk, so I figured I'd end the video with a start, maybe a little bit of a rev. Um, you can hear the exhaust and kind of how leaky it is, but uh, uh, I figured I'd, I'd give you guys what you seem to like.